All right, let's go over these homework problems. Okay, question one. When you're opening a hinged door, the handle is on the opposite door side of the door. Rank the difficulty opening it. Okay, so when you're furthest from the hinge, that's going to be the easiest op open uh, to open. And when you're at the uh, edges, right at the hinge, it's hard to open. And if you're at the center, it's somewhere in between. And that's because torque is force times distance. So the further away you are from the axis of rotation, the bigger your torque is. And that torque uh, is going to give you, uh, help you open the, the uh, thing up. Okay, you got Apollo and Artemis. They're playing on a teeter totter. Okay, so here's Apollo. Uh, let me do it like this. There's Apollo and there's Artemis. Okay, and there's your pivot point. Mercury comes in, sits next to them, and uh, adds a new torque. So now you have two torques over on this side. Question is, what does um, Apollo have to do in order to keep the sum of the torques equal to zero? So we've got Apollo uh, times distance Apollo is, and that has to be balanced out with Mercury times where they are, uh, L2, let's say, um, plus uh, the, uh, you know, this is the weight, so it's the mg, plus the mass of uh, Artemis, and then uh, gravity over there times that distance. So what is Apollo going to have to do? Apollo is going to have to scooch out further away to, uh, to balance out the torque. And there's two options for moving further away. In this case, we want it to balance out a larger torque um, because uh, when mercury is added to it, the torque increases. So we got to balance out the um, uh, you know larger torque. Okay, so we've got uh, these uh, scenarios here. Um, the question is sort these things by the torques, biggest torques. Okay, so torque. What is torque? It's force, which in this case is weight. So we have weight times distance. So scenario B, to my eye, looks like the biggest torque because it's the longest uh, lever arm with um, the weight on it. And the weight's the same for all these. So the only thing I'm looking at is what's the lever arm, I'm sorting by largest, longest lever arm. So E and B, they're the same uh, because the length of this is the same length. Um, so B equals E. Uh, and there's this one, B equals E, and, B, and E equals B. So those are our two options uh, to choose from. Those are your biggest torques, okay? So we got this, we got that, and they're equal to each other. And then we have scenario C, there is no torque here um, because it's weight and then times distance. There's no distance vector there. It's just pulling straight down. So this thing will not rotate at all. It will just hang there. So C has to be at the end. Uh, well, both these have C at the end, okay? So we're not any closer. Um, the next question is what's bigger, B, uh, D or A? Well, they look like they're the same lengths, but the difference is the angle. This is 90 degrees, and that's uh, less than 90 degrees, um, you know, from the actual. So that, that would be the angle there. So that's less than 90 degrees. So um, we have uh, scenario D is bigger than scenario A. And we don't even have to look at that because we know they're not equal. So it can't be this one uh, where D equals A. So it must be uh, this option. Okay, because there, there, there's an angle there, so it can't be that um, D is equal to A, and so it should be that one. Okay, good. And then we've got another sort the torques. Okay, so again, I'm looking for the longest lever arm with the biggest force, and then in this case, the shortest lever arm with the less than 90 degrees, and then that one. Um, it's close short lever arm, but it's 90 degrees, so it's bigger than the other short lever arm, and that angle there. Okay, then we've got our palmaris longest muscle in the forearm. We've got it flexed, and um, the wrist moves back and forth when you flex it. Muscle generates a force of 45.5 newtons. It's got a lever arm of 2.45 centimeters. What's the torque? Okay, the torque is just uh, torque equals force uh, times distance. So we've got 45.5 newtons times 0 0.0245 meters because we want it in newton meters okay okay so remember your torques sum of your torques equals i alpha but an individual torque is a force times a lever arm a force times a distance okay uh bones of the forearm so we've got um uh a uh, hinge point here and we've got the bones there and we've got a bicep muscle pulling a force there and we've got a weight in the hand pointing down here, and then we've got that the forearm has a mass and a length, so the forearm itself is gonna have um, weight. And so our bicep muscle needs to pull up on this arm 
which is gonna cause the arm to rotate if we pull hard enough. We wanna balance these three torques out. We've got the weight of the arm, the weight of this thing in the hand, and the bicep pulling up, and those are our balances. So we have to add up our torques, and we want the sum of our torques to be equal to zero. Um, so we've got that the uh, force of the bicep times the length, which is this little distance here, uh, 2.15 centimeters, so it's gonna be 0 0.0215 meters. That torque is inducing a counterclockwise rotation. It would cause this thing to rotate that way, so we're gonna make that a positive torque. And then we've got minus, we've got the weight of the arm, which is mass of the arm times G, times how far it is from the pivot point, um, which is gonna be 0 0.445 meters divided by two. The reason it's divided by two is because it says the length of the arm is 0.445, but we know the center of mass is halfway uh, through the length because it's a equal mass of 2.35 or a uniform mass, we're assuming. And then the mass that the person is holding here, pulling down, it's minus the weight of that thing. So this is a different weight, weight one, weight two, uh, times the full length because that lever arm is the full length here, uh, 0.445 meters um, and those are the torques okay and then set that all equal to zero and solve for the force that the bicep is applying okay so done with that delete and then this one merry-go-round in order to get moving you got a 25 newton force okay so you've got a merry-go-round here you apply a 25 newton force to the merry-go-round that's 8.7 meters from the axis of rotation what's the torque um, that's just 25 newtons times this uh, 8.7 meters, and we'll give you the torque there. Zane and Phoebe are sitting on opposite ends of a teeter-totter, four meters long, with the pivot point at the center. Okay, so you've got teeter-totter at the center, so it's two meters to the center and two meters to the center. Um, Zane uh, is over there, 473, and Phoebe's over here uh, with uh, 341. Um, so the question is, what torque does Zane exert? So Zane is uh, 473 newtons times 2 meters, so it would be 946. Phoebe's 341. 341 times 2. Uh, 341 times 2 is 682. So those are the two um, torques. How much additional torque is needed on Phoebe's side to balance Zane's? Um, so if you do 470, well, okay. This torque is 946, her torque 682, so minus 946, so it'll be 264 extra Newton meters um, to balance out those two. And then if you add 172 Newton weight uh, to balance the teeter-totter, where should it be placed? So you want um, uh, 264 Newton meters is your extra um, torque you need to add, so you're gonna have 264 Newton meters is equal to 172 Newtons times how many meters? So if you take 264 divided by 172, um, that tells you it needs to be uh, 1.53 meters uh, away. Uh, I may have done that. Okay, that's wrong because the question is, how far from Phoebe should it be placed? So if I solve for L here, that's 1.5 three meters from the uh, axis of rotation, and she is um, two meters out. So we're gonna take uh, two meters and we get four, four, six, five, okay? Delete that. So she's two meters at the edge. We wanna place this 1.53 meters from the center, um, but uh, so we have to take the difference there. So we get 946, 682, 264, and 0.65, and that should be our problem. Okay, now we've got a doozy here, a little bit of a hard one. A ladder is leaning against a vertical wall. Both ends of the ladder are at the point of slipping. The coefficient of friction between the ladder and horizontal surface is this. Um, determine the maximum angle before it slips and falls to the ground. Okay, so the key to this problem is uh, the force diagram. Okay, so what are our forces? We have um, this ladder sitting here, and if it wants to slide that way but isn't, that's because we have a force of friction here, F1. That's keeping it from sliding. Same thing here. This thing wants to slide down, but it isn't because there's a force of friction, F2, there. Okay, then um, the wall is pushing back with a normal force, 
and the floor is pushing back with a normal force, and those normal forces are what cause the force of friction. So we know that F2 is uh, mu2 times the normal force, Fn1, and we know that F1 is equal to mu1 times Fn, uh, I got these messed up, 2 and 1. I'm gonna name, oh yeah, that's okay. So F2 is mu2 times F normal 2. Let me just call these uh, 2. It'll be easier if I uh, have that 2 in this one, 1. Okay, and, uh, and so, okay, so those are your forces from friction, and those are the relationships between the force, uh, forces of friction and those normal forces. But then we also have um, uh, the weight of the ladder, okay? So minus the weight, okay? And so that is um, uh, uh, another thing, okay? So the question is determine the maximum angle alpha. So what we can do uh, in this problem is add up all our torques. We want this, the torques here to be perfectly balanced, everything to be maximally, uh, so all of our torques equals zero. And then that's gonna solve, we'll solve for the angle when that's the case where they're, everything exactly balances each other. You could have you know, a shallower angle where your you know, forces are uh, you know, not completely maxed out, but we wanna solve for the case where everything is perfectly balanced. So we want some of our torques to be equal to zero. Um, and the torques we have, okay, we're gonna choose um, this point to be our axis of rotation, okay? And so then what we want to do, if that's our axis of rotation, we're going to do our um, uh, line of action um, to determine our torques from all these things, okay? So let me go back and clean this up a little bit. So we can go one by one. Okay, so if this is our, if we choose this to be, oops, if we choose um, if we choose this, uh, that point to be our axis of rotation, then these torques uh, do not uh, come into our equation because we're the, those torques times the distance are zero. So our first torque we can do is this weight, and then we need to multiply it by um, uh, weight times the lever arm. And in this case, do, 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 there's our line of action. Okay, and the distance between um, the weight and the uh, uh, ladder, the horizontal axis is um, the opposite. So we want to know how far away this line is, the line of action is from our pivot point, Doop, because that's our 90 degree um, location. So this, this side, is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So that's um, cosine, uh, sine. So L, L, if the ladder is L long, L sine theta, okay, because sine, well, not theta, but alpha. Sine of alpha is equal to this distance, let's call it X divided by the hypotenuse L. So L sine alpha is equal to that distance, and we want half that distance because it's um, half the distance away um, from the full, it's not the full distance, it's half of that. So we're gonna divide this by two. Okay, so there's our torque due to the weight. Okay, the torque due to the weight. Um, then we are going to um, do our next force, uh, which is gonna be the normal force Fn2. And let's draw our line of action through there, and we wanna know how far away is that line of action from our axis of rotation, and that is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's gonna be, um, uh, so our weight is going to induce a counterclockwise rotation, so that's positive. This normal force, Fn2, is going to induce a clockwise rotation, so we're gonna have minus Fn2 times its lever arm, Fn2 times its lever arm, uh, which is uh, cosine of alpha times L. And then we have um, the torque from F2, the force of friction, um, and F2 is going to uh, 
create a force of friction that is uh, uh, going to cause a clockwise rotation too. Um, that force will end up uh, wanting, wants it to rotate clockwise. So we're going to have another minus sign times the force of friction too. And then again, our line of action is uh, how far away is it? This is the full um, sine F2 sine alpha L, okay? So those are our three torques that are at play, weight, Fn2, and F2, okay? And those three things have to add up to zero in order for this thing to be static. So you have W L sine alpha over two minus Fn2 cosine alpha L minus F2 sine alpha L equals zero. Notice all the L's cancel. Okay, so let me erase those. So we don't need to know the length of the ladder. Now I'm gonna do something cool. What if I divide everything by cosine? Okay, so if I divide everything by cosine, cosine alpha, cosine alpha, cosine alpha, and then zero divided by that is still zero, cancels out here, and these turn into tangent. So now this sine over cosine is tangent, so I have W tangent of alpha, and then this is one, and then we have tangent of alpha, tangent of alpha. Okay, so then we have, we can factor out the tangent of alpha, we have tan, because we're trying to solve for alpha. Tangent of alpha, okay, uh, factor that out, we have W over two, and then uh, minus F2, the force of friction, and then that is equal to Fn2. And so then we can, uh, solve for tangent of alpha is equal to F n 2 the normal force divided by W over 2 minus F2 okay and so there's that's how you solve for the angle now let's erase this because we have that equation up there so now we need to figure out these other things uh, we don't know F n 2 and we don't know F2 but we know that F2 is mu 2 F n 2 and we know that F1 is mu 1 F n 1 so we can take this tangent of alpha equation equals Fn2, and we can say that um, we'll keep our Fn2 in there divided by W over two minus, and then F2 is mu two times Fn2, okay? And then it's a matter of uh, going through the algebra and um, you know taking W, for example, um, and then Fn2, uh, mu two, Fn2, blah, 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 substituting those in um, and getting them to cancel out. Um, and then when you do that, you just end up with the ratio of the coefficients of friction and um, the mass of the ladder, which cancels out if I remember correctly. And then uh, you end up just with this ratio and you can solve for alpha. So from here on out, it's just algebra. And so good luck. Let's go on to the next uh, thing. Okay, next. A person pushing a wheelbarrow. Okay, so we've got a wheelbarrow going up this thing at this angle. The wheelbarrow and the load have a combined mass of 29.95 kilograms with the center of mass. Okay, so we're gonna have uh, halfway at the length, we've got the weight of the load of the wheelbarrow. So we've got an mg there. And then we've got the length of this thing. And then we've got very kind of them to include the fx. Well, what we need to figure out is what's the Fy, um, because what we want is the net force, F net, that someone has to apply to this thing. So we know that F net is gonna equal the square root of Fx squared plus Fy squared. So we wanna ultimately figure out our Fx and our Fy so that we can go back to that equation and determine what our F net is. Okay, so um, in this case, we have the same thing, the sum of the torques should be equal to zero. What do we have? We have uh, W times L over two. Let's say we choose that to be our pivot point, uh, this point here. So W times L over two, and that's gonna wanna induce a counterclockwise rotation. So that's positive minus this Fy times L, whatever that is. Um, and those are uh, the torques we have, and that has to equal zero. And so then we have uh, W times L, well, the L's cancel like normal. Um, so we have W over 2 is equal to Fy. So Fy is just half the weight, which kind of makes sense. Um, and then uh, we know what M is, so we can figure out what Fy is. 
uh, so w is mg, so we can figure out what fy is, so now we know fy, check, um, now we just need to figure out what fx is, okay, and then uh, there's a, since we're using this as our pivot point, I didn't draw this force yet, but there is a normal force here, fn, and um, that is in addition to Fy balancing out the weight. So um, we have the sum of our torques here. So we have that um, uh, Fy is equal to W over two, but we also know that Fy plus Fn uh, Y, if we can get the Y component of Fn, has to equal the weight because that's our regular sum of the forces equals zero. So we need our Fy to balance out our Fn, and then we also know that our Fn x component is equal to the equal and opposite to the x component of our push force. So we're pushing Fx into the into the wall, but the wall is pushing back, um, and so we have our two sum of our forces. Some of the forces in the y direction uh, have to add up to the weight, and the sum of the forces in the x direction have to add up to the, each other. In this case, there's only two: the push force and the f x direction, and then the x component of the normal force. So you end up that um, you can solve for FNY. So you have FNY is equal to W minus FY. And so that should also, if FY is W over 2, then FNY should also be W over 2. And then uh, F sine theta is equal to FY. So you can solve for F. And then F cosine theta is equal to FX. Um, and so F cosine theta uh, will give you your X component of the force. And then you just take um, that squared plus Fy squared, square root it, and then you have the total force uh, necessary to support all this stuff. Okay, so that's a tough one. Um, that's a tough one too. So after an accident, we have to figure out this problem here. All right, so what you're going to do, you've got, uh, they give you the tension in the rope. Um, they give you uh, D and H, so they give you this and that sides of the thing, um, and they want to know what's the magnitude of the load, what is this force when it collapsed, okay? So we're going to, again, solve all our torques, set them equal to zero, and then just before the collapse, that was the case. Um, so they give us that the, t the tension is 11,390 newtons, and that um, we've got, okay, so if that's the full tension, then what we want is Ty and then Tx here. So T sine theta, um, if this is T, then and that's theta, then the opposite over hypotenuse is Ty. So T sine theta uh, is equal to Ty, and T cosine theta is equal to Tx. And then we have this weight here, mg, okay, and that's, or just WL, and that's what we need to figure out. So what are our, those are, those are our, oh, and then we have that the rod itself has a weight. Okay, so if we add up all our torques here, okay, um, some of the torques have to equal zero. What do we got? We've got Ty, the y component of the tension force, times the length of this thing, d minus s, because that's located s in from the end. So if our full pivot point is d, d minus s gets us to that point. Okay, so d, Ty, d minus s, and that one's going to induce a counterclockwise rotation, so that's positive. Then the other two torques minus WL times D minus X, and then minus the weight of this thing, um, which they tell us it's 93 kilograms per length per meter. So we're going to have 90, 90, sorry, 93.6 times D. That's going to be the mass because um, it's 93.6 kilograms per meter times D meters will give us the total mass, and then times D over 2. Um, because it's located halfway through D, okay? And then set that equal to zero. So you have T sine theta times D minus S minus WL times D minus X minus this equals zero. And then um, they want to know what WL is. So from there, you can just solve for WL, um, and then that will give you the um, load just before it collapses. Okay, so then, uh, so there's only those uh, three torques that you add up and solve. Then the question is, what's the magnitude of the force FP? Okay, so um, FP, you're going to have FPY and you're going to have FPX. So the net resulting force will be somewhere off in the distance there. 
So you're going to have that FPY um, plus TY have to balance out the weight of the uh, arm plus the weight of the load, because you're going to have these two weights pulling down, and then you've got these two tension force and that FPY holding everything. So you can solve for FPY um, at that point. And then you know that FP, oops, FPX is equal to TX um, because FPX and TX are the only two forces here working together. So whatever the tension X force is pushing in, the wall is pushing back out. And so then you can get FPX and FPY, and then you can do the square root of FPX plus FPY, each of those squared, and that will give you F net, okay? Uh, next, um, then you've got uh, this problem. So this is a little bit simpler. We've just got this fulcrum here, and then we've got uh, this weight down, this weight down, they're equal and opposite, and they've got these two lever arms. So you've got FW times X2 has to equal FM times X1, and the question is what's FM? You can solve for that um, because it's just this force times that distance uh, minus this force times that distance because they're working in opposite directions. And then the question is what's the force exerted by the pivot head? Um, and so FJ, so this is from the sum of the torques, have to be equal to zero. This is the sum of the forces have to be zero. So you have Fj is equal to Fm plus Fw. So once you find Fm, add it to Fw, and then this has to push back on both of those forces. Okay, uh, I don't have to erase all that. Next. Um, you've got a homeowner trying to lift a rock or whatever. Um, you got a lever arm here. So this rock is going to induce, you've got a weight, um, the weight of the rock times this distance, 0 0.266 is the torque. You want to lift this thing up, so you're going to have to apply a force of um, 623 newtons times some distance to get this thing to move, and so if you just solve for how far uh, from that pivot point to cause that torque, um, it says what's the minimum length if you solve for L here, that's going to be the distance from there, and then you're going to want to do L plus D to add this back onto it to find the length of the rod. That's a tricky point in the problem. What's the total length of the rod? Well, it's going to be the length from the fulcrum point, which you'll solve here, but you're going to want to add that to get the total length of the thing. Okay, um, next. Sledgehammer uh, wants... Where it's read to the point mass, rotation is on a various axis. So um, rank the rotational inertia. So basically the furthest you are away from the mass is going to be where the greatest inertia is. So A should be the most, B should be the next most, um, C and E should be in there, and then D is going to have the lowest. Check your answer there. And uh, you're just... The furthest away you are, mr squared, the furthest away you are from the mass, the bigger your moment of inertia. Okay, and then we've got um, this one. You've got these different objects here. Rank them from the slowest to the fastest. So you get the penny, the hollow globe, the large marble, the wedding ring. So what you want to do is look up the table of moments of inertias for these objects. For a, a penny is a disc. A hollow globe is a hollow sphere. A large marble is a solid sphere. A wedding ring is a... Uh, is a ring, um, and so you're going to want to look those up and assume they, uh, I guess, are similar. What are they? Objects are placed at the top of a ramp to roll down without assuming they're... Yeah, so you're just going to rank these from the moments of inertias. Okay, so just look what those are, mr squareds, because um, the bigger the moment of inertia, the lower their speed is going to be because more of their energy is going to be going into rotating. So you're going to have your MGH equals one-half MV squared plus one-half I omega squared. Uh, the bigger the moment of inertia is, the less V you have. Um, so that's what you want to look for. Uh, how would a spinning disk kinetic energy change if the inertia was five times larger, but the um, omega was... Okay, so you've got a disk. You start rotating it. Um, it initially has some kinetic energy, um, one-half I omega squared. But then you uh, make the I five times bigger, and you make the omega five times smaller, so omega over five squared. Okay, so what happens? You get one-half five I 
um, and then omega squared over 25. This is 1 half times i omega squared times 1 fifth. Okay, so um, you have your original 1 half i omega squared, but by increasing i by 5 times and decreasing omega by 5 times, you change the moment of inertia by 1 fifth. 1 divided by 5 is 0.2. Um, and so it will end up decreasing at that point, too. A solid sphere of radius r, a solid cylinder of radius r, and a hollow cylinder, all the same mass, same rotating velocity, the sphere's rotating, blah, 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 blah. Um, which one has the greatest rotational energy? Okay, so rotational kinetic energy is 1 half i omega squared. So again, you're going to want to look up your um, moments of inertia for the different things, solid sphere, solid cylinder, and a hollow cylinder, whichever one has the biggest i is going to have the most energy. Okay, next. Suppose that a solid ball, solid disc, have the same mass, same radius. Each object is set rolling without slipping up in incline with the same initial energy. Okay, so they have the same initial energy, and at the end, all of that energy is going to turn into mgh. They all have the same mass, um, so they're all going to end up at the same height. If they start with the same energy, it'll all go into potential energy. Potential energy just gives you mgh. Okay, delete. Um... Suppose that a solid ball, a solid disc, and a hoop all have the same mass and same radius. Each object is set rolling and slipping up with the same speed. Okay, so you're going to have uh, 1 half uh, mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared. Okay, and so you're going to have 1 half mv squared plus 1 half, and then i is going to be whatever you replace it with, um, i, so some mr squared of some kind, and then omega is going to be uh, v squared r, oh, sorry, v squared over r squared, that's what omega is, omega is equal to v over r, okay, so then, um, when you replace i, you're going to get some other m v squared in there, and so what you're going to do is, whichever one has the biggest initial energy, that one is going to go up, uh, highest, okay, and so that's, that's, um, what you want to look for, is whichever one has the biggest this component, um, add that to this. So whichever has the greatest initial kinetic energy, they're all going with the same linear speed, but they don't all have the same energy. So you got to figure out their total initial energy, and that'll tell you which one gets up highest. Okay, uh, you got an artist pulls the lar arms in, so R gets smaller. What happens to rotational inertia? Um, and then angular momentum goes like I omega. So if you change I either increase or decrease angular momentum as Emmy pulls her legs and arms in, how does the rotational speed change? And again, uh, if you change angular momentum, it equals I omega, so you're going to have to change your uh, omega as well. Okay. Uh, engine flywheel rotates and then slows down. Okay. So you're going to have omega final minus omega initial is equal to alpha times T. So you start at um, uh, 2.11 rotations uh, per second minus uh, 6.99 rotations per second. And actually, in this case, it goes from counterclockwise to clockwise. So you're going to have a total change of um, 6.99 plus 2.11 because you go from 6.99 to 0 and then to 2.11. So your total change in velocity is that whole thing. Um, if you divide that by 20.3 seconds, then you get alpha, but you get that in revolutions per second squared. Um, and then, so what you need is to, because this is rotations per second, um, so then what you need to do is multiply, there's 2 pi radians per every revolution, so if you multiply your answer by 2 pi, uh, then you'll get the answer. Okay, you got an ultra centrifuge accelerates from rest to 9.81 times 10 to the fifth RPMs in 1.75 minutes. What is its angular acceleration in radians per second squared? Okay, um, you, just, you can do all this. Um, optical disk drive, same thing. You're going to do just those um, change in omegas, solve for alpha. Okay, you got a uniform thin rod of mass m. The kinematics equations for the previous one. A uniform thin rod of mass m is 3.55 kilogram pivoting around an axis through its center perpendicular to its length. Two small bodies, each of mass m equals 0.295 kilograms are attached to the ends of the rod. What must the length L be of the rod so that the moment of inertia of three bodies is this I? Okay, so um, you have to look up what the moment of inertia I is for the rod, for a th uniform thin rod of mass M um, rotating around uh, the uh, 
this pivot point. So that's going to be, you know, one half mr squared or some form of that. Um, and then you add two masses. So then you're going to add mr squared, mr squared for each of those. Uh, and in this case, that's going to be uh, L over 2 squared is how far away those masses are. Um, and then, so you add those three together to get your total moment of inertia. Um, what must the length L be so that when you add them all up, then you get uh, 0 0.997. Okay, so then you solve for what L must be, um, L over 2 squared, and then plus the whatever it is for the rod. Okay, next. The wheels of a wagon can be approximated as a combination of a thin outer hoop, okay? So the farmer wants to replace a thin disc with a solid disc, and the question is, um, what should the radius of the disc be if we want to keep the moment of inertia the same, okay? So um, you solve for what I is, it'll be some one, you know, half m r squared, and then for the disc, I can't remember. Uh, uh, I think it's, whatever. I don't remember. Shoot, that's embarrassing. Uh, one half mr squared, and then, okay, don't make me do it. Uh, let's go to moment of inertia list. Okay, images, and let's do this. So we've got a, nope, this one. MR, one half MR squared versus MR squared. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so we've got, um, stop. MR squared and one half MR squared, okay? So we want them to be equal to each other. So what do we have to do um, in order to uh, get the radius to be, what radius should it be in order for them to so solve for R? Now the difference is um, you've got your radii there, and the mass there. Um, Oh, and you got two thin rods, so you're gonna have mr squared plus the moment of inertia of the two rods rotating about their centers. Um, so you have to add that in and then solve for this this one. Okay. Next, uh, flywheel in the form of uniform distance the clockwise calculate the constant torque required. To, so sum of torques equals I alpha. Okay, and so you're gonna want to solve uh, for the acceleration to get the alpha. And then the torque is I times that, so you'll get an I times your alpha, and that'll be the torque required to stop it. Uniform rod is set up to rotate around an axis perpendicular to one of its ends. The length and mass of the rod are 0.783 meters and 1.05 kilograms, respectively. A force of constant magnitude F act on the rod at the ends opposite the rotation axis. The direction of the force is perpendicular to both the rod's length and the rotation axis. Calculate the force F that will accelerate the rod from rest to an angular speed of this. Okay, so um, force times distance equals torque, and the torque equals I alpha. So um, you have to calculate what alpha is, and then once you have alpha, you can solve for, since you know how um, long the length is, 0.783 meters, then you can divide your torque by 0.783 meters to get your um, torque. Okay, so then we got a mass here tied to a piece of thread, um, and we want to find the acceleration. Okay, so we're going to have a uh, mass here uh, times the radius r is going to be the torque. Okay, so we're going to be applying a torque um, at this distance r uh, around this thing, and this torque is going to cause um, this uh, uh, the torque that we apply is going to equal I alpha is going to cause this thing to rotate and this is I and then alpha is A over R so we can get the acceleration the regular acceleration of this and that's going to be the same as the acceleration of this mass as it falls down um, so you set you say that your torque here um, M times W times G times R that torque is going to equal I times A over R uh, and then I for the disc is one half mr squared or something like that. So you're going to have mwgr is equal to one half uh, ms and one half mr squared times a over r. So that's going to cancel out one of the r's, and then this one's going to cancel out the other r. So you have mwg is equal to well, times two 
times 2 mwg times 2 divided by m sub s is equal to your acceleration. Okay, so you can solve for your acceleration um, that way. And then, uh, let's see, do, do, do. And then the tension, uh, find the tension in the thread. The tension in the, th in the thread um, is going to be the difference, the m w minus the tension. So you got m w down, and then you're going to have tension up is equal to the mass w times a times the acceleration of this thing. So the difference between these two things, so once you have your acceleration, then the tension is just m w times um, m w times 1 minus a, something like that. Okay, um, this should be g. There should be g's on all this. Uh, g. Okay, I screwed up. You should have a g somewhere in there, right? Because the force is mg, and then minus tension is going to equal ma. So there's going to be tension is equal to uh, gmw minus mwa. So you're going to have mw times g minus a. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, okay, something like that. Delete. Next, propeller is modeled as five identical uniform rods extending radially from its axis. The length and mass of each rod are this and that. What when the propeller rotates this, what is the rotational kinetic energy? So you're going to have one half i omega squared. So you can determine the i because it's five uniform rods, so add up the moments of inertia, or five times the moment of inertia of a rod, um, and then you got to convert 581 revolutions per minute to radians per second, and then one half i omega squared. Um, we'll get you the answer there. Okay, you got two buckets of mass blah attached to the ends of a rope, pulls, rotates over a pulley. Okay, this is a really hard problem. Assume that the rope does not slip on the pulley and that the pulley rotates without friction. Uh, okay, so you're going to have the weight of this bucket, the weight of that bucket, then you're going to have the tension here and the tension here. Okay, and then you've got this radius here, and this thing is going to rotate. So you know that W1 minus T1 is equal to M1A, and then you know that W2 minus T2 is equal to M2A, and everything's accelerating together at the same acceleration, so that's your key. So then you know that um, the torques here, so there's your normal Newton's law thing, uh, the sum of the torques here uh, are going to be T1 times R, which is going to uh, be pulling uh, uh, down, let's see, that's going to induce a counterclockwise, T1 times R minus T2 times R, okay, and that's going to equal I alpha, but that's going to equal I times uh, a over r, okay? So um, we can turn that rotational acceleration into linear acceleration at the perimeter of this circle. And so then you look up the rot moment of inertia i for the disk, should be m one half mr squared, um, and then uh, uh, put that in there for i. And the question is, uh, the bucket is released if the Buckets are released from rest to begin the move. The larger bucket is 1.85 meters above the ground when it's released. What, with what speed will it hit the ground? Okay, so once you've figured that out, then you get acceleration, and then you have x um, equals uh, uh, let's see, v final squared equals uh, 2ax, and so v final is going to be the square root of 2g, or in this case 2gy. Um, so you know that the um, not 2gy, but 2ay, two times our acceleration, it's going to be less than g, 2ay. And then once you have that, uh, once you have your acceleration from solving this problem, then you can solve for, uh, after it falls 1.85 meters and accelerates that, that speed, what, how fast it, will it be going? Okay, that's a hard problem. Next, um, you've got a solid kilogram ball rolls without slipping down a track. Um, with the loop, this radius, what minimum speed must the ball have when it uh, is a height 1.51? Okay, so it starts out 1.51 meters above the track, and it needs to go through the loop without um, falling off, so it needs enough energy to go around. So we need um, the, uh, the ball here to 
go around this thing. Um, <laughs> figure is not to scale. Um, so we need to maintain our energy. So we need enough mgh, but we also need enough kinetic energy, one half mv squared, but we also need, um, since it's rolling without slipping, um, one half i omega squared, uh, mgh plus one half mv squared plus one half, and then we've got one half, um, it's a ball. Uh, let's go to, um, uh, what was it, uh, moment of inertia list. Okay, uh, images for a ball, it should be uh, two, two fifths, yeah, mr squared. Um, go back. So we've got one, one mgh plus one half mv squared plus one half times two fifths mr squared times m uh, r v squared v squared over r squared. Okay, those cancel. So we get mgh plus one half mv squared plus uh, one fifth mv squared. Okay, so then uh, this is a uh, five tenths and two tenths, so we've got seven tenths. So we have uh, a total seven tenths mv squared for our total kinetic energy. So we wanna know how fast it has to be going initially um, to make it through the loop. And so we want our total energy here to equal the energy required to keep it on this loop. And so we want it to have, um, uh, in this case, it's just, we can, treat it like a point mass mr squared um, going around one half uh, i omega squared. We want to make sure that it has enough kinetic energy to stay around this thing. So you're going to have one half i omega squared, you're going to have one half mv squared, and then you're going to solve for the v uh, necessary to keep it on this loop, loop to loop. So you're going to combine your um, other uh, equations, your kinematic equations. Um, to solve for the case when this uh, happens. So this is another hard problem. Okay, delete. A lot of hard problems in here. Next, a professor sits on a rotating stool spinning at 10 RPMs while she holds a heavy weight in each hand. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, angular momentum conservation. So I omega initially equals I omega finally, and you're going to want to convert everything to radians per second probably, and just treat her like a two point masses. Okay, and then we've got a circular platform rotating freely with no friction about its center, initial velocity of this, a monkey drops bananas vertically on it. So again, you got I omega initial and then I omega finally, and set them equal to each other. Okay, and then uh, three children on a merry-go-round. The merry-go-round is spinning at 16 RPMs. The children have masses, blah. If the 28 kilogram child moves to the center of the merry-go-round, what is the new angular velocity? So again, I omega initial equals I omega final. Um, so set them equal to each other. And then we get the circular platform. Uh, you are here, blah, blah, blah. Your poodle walks around the other way, half the speed. Your mutt, on the other hand, model the platform as a disk, calculate the total angular momentum. So you're just adding up all your I omegas. Okay, um, you got your carnival game. Okay, this is a little bit of a hard problem. Um, so this is a conservation of momentum problem. You're gonna have M1 V1. So this ball just before it hits is gonna equal the same ball just after it hits um, plus the uh, momentum of the thing. Uh, but what we have to do is say that this is M1 and then we're gonna have M, uh, we gotta replace V. V1 is equal to um, omega times R. Okay, so you're gonna have M1 and then omega uh, R is equal to M2, uh, sorry, what we want to do is just replace V1, uh, now let me just do it this way, stop, yeah. okay, uh, this ball is coming in with a certain velocity and a certain radius above the thing, so we're going to treat it as uh, angular momentum, so we have M R squared times omega, which is um, V1 over R, and so you're going to have, and this R is the ball is, um, the ball hits, it says here, that far um, above where the ball hits, okay? So you're going to have M R squared times V1 over R. So you get M R V1 uh, is equal to M R V2. 
uh, plus, um, and then the thing rotates and it's gonna have its own i omega, its own initial, its own uh, uh, angular momentum. And it gives us what uh, omega is, and it wants to know what is i. So it gives us omega, gives us everything else. You can just solve for i um, directly. Okay, and then afterwards you have you want to know the center of mass, so you're going to do linear momentum, mv1 is equal to mv2 plus the mass of this thing times its final velocity, and you can solve for what its final velocity is afterwards. So it's angular momentum first, and then linear momentum for the second part. Okay, and then suppose there are two solid steel spheres. The second sphere has a radius twice as large as the radius of the first. What is the ratio of the moments of inertia i2 to i1? Okay, and just you know, look those things up and uh, set them equal to each other, and then divide f, divide them, and then everything cancels out except the ratio. Okay, bye.